Hey, and welcome to the Ambitious Bookkeeper podcast. I am Serena Shoup. I am a CPA and mom of three, and I'm running a virtual bookkeeping business, mostly from my home. You're in the right place if you're a bookkeeper, accountant, or an accounting student, and you know that your purpose is bigger than sitting in a cubicle. If you're ready to learn some actionable tips and strategies to help you start and grow a bookkeeping or accounting business, I hope you stick around. Welcome back, bookkeepers and accountants. That was really lame. Okay, today, this week's episode is all about how to find your new bookkeeping clients. (laughs) I am like this, it's, I'm batching some episodes. I'm getting a little bit ridiculous. It's getting kind of late and (laughs) I feel so dorky right now. Okay, one of the most common questions bookkeepers have is how do I find clients? Before you decide on where you where to look, you first have to do a little bit of work ahead of time, okay? You have to do a little bit of work to identify what kind of clients that you actually want so you know where to look for them, where to focus your efforts. It's really common for people in our industry to say, you have to have a niche, and it's, it's true. Finding clients does get a lot easier once you have a niche. But no one is really talking about how to identify your your niche, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes, when you're just starting out and you have no freaking clue what you want your niche to be in. And that's okay. That's why I'm here. It's literally like why I'm here. Um, this is how, this is why I started the, the blog that I started because there's a gap. There's a huge gap between like all the people that have been doing it forever and ever and they all these new people come in and they're like, I don't know what to do or where to look. And all the other people that have been doing this for years and years and years or decades are like, I don't know why it's so hard. You just need to find a niche. Well, no one's telling you how to get there. So (laughs) here we are. This is, this is the podcast. Okay, guys. Okay. So if you have your niche, great. I'll help you figure out how to get even better clients within that niche. But otherwise, this is the process that I recommend following to start developing a niche. Maybe we should start saying niche. Maybe I should flip-flop. I, I really don't know how to say this. I'm, I'm pretty sure nobody knows how to say it. I'm gonna, I'll just do half the episode calling it a niche and half of it a niche. I think I started, call, I'm gonna just do a little tan, side tangent right now. I'm pretty sure I started calling it a niche because of the quote, the riches are in the, and you can't say, <laughs> you can't say the riches are in the niches. <laughs> Okay, so here's a process I recommend following to start developing a niche. I should probably cut that whole thing out, but I'm not gonna. First, you want to identify who your ideal client is. Um, I recently started calling this your perfect fit client. Okay, figure out who that perfect client is. Um, And there's a process for that, of course, but I'm not gonna dive too deep into it today. Uh, Number two, you can start to follow your passions and where you have experience and knowledge, right? You can start developing a niche based on where you used to work in corporate, the type of industry or the type of clients you've previously worked with, or it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't even need to be in accounting. For instance, I started my my accounting career, I guess, if you will, in the back office of a grocery store But before I actually was doing the accounting, I was cashiering, I was um, washing produce, unloading trucks, uh, just doing basic back office stuff, answering phones. So I learned a lot about the operations of a grocery store. That, my friends, counts. Especially if you understand the operations and you understand the language and you understand what types of vendors that client's going to be working with because you understand the industry. You're like leaps and bounds ahead of everyone else, okay? So you can start to narrow it down by following your passions or your, your previous knowledge or experience. And then you can just narrow it down later as you go, okay? You don't have to figure out who your perfect client is now and only take clients exactly like that. You can still take other clients and narrow it down based on what you feel like you jive with, all right? So let's now get into kind of the nitty gritty on identifying step one, identifying your perfect fit client. Your ideal client is someone you have in your mind when you think about the type of person that you want to work with. 
So behind every business is a person. Figuring out the core values you want in the clients that you work with is the first step. It's also really helpful to make this into maybe a list and keep it in mind when you're evaluating whether or not to work with a client after a discovery call. Like literally make a list of the core values that you want to hold true to. Um, Even if you have an idea of the type of industry you want to work with, you still want to work with good clients. Am I right? (laughs) You don't want to work with like shady people with no ethics or clients that are like price shopping and they're always going to negotiate with you and maybe treat you like an employee. Okay. So identifying your ideal client avatar or your perfect fit, perfect fit client, whatever you want to call them, will help you focus your marketing efforts and networking efforts. The more specific you are, the easier it becomes to attract the right clients. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> The more specific you are, the easier it becomes to attract the right clients. Okay, so if you're into writing things down, list out some of those core values that you expect your client to have. For example, ethical, coachable, charitable. Maybe they value doing things the right way. And if it's hard for you to list those, you can list the characteristics that you don't want. Um, There is clarity in contrast. For example, if they complain about taxes. If they don't follow out, follow through on requests, they're hard to get a hold of. They complain about your prices. They're always trying to bend the rules. Like just choose the opposite of all those things that you don't want. Um, another facet to consider is what your ideal client's minimum revenue is. And this is really important if you actually want to charge a premium price because they actually do need to be able to afford you. I know there's a lot of businesses out there that will hire coaches and consultants for a lot of money because they promise that you'll get a a huge ROI but we are in the business of building trust for one you can't really promise an ROI Uh, and two you want them to be with you long term it's a recurring revenue model so you don't want to lock them in at a ridiculously high price that you know that they can't afford because then they're just going to end up having to cancel you So if you're wanting to charge a premium price, but you only want to work with solopreneurs just starting out, you have a mismatch. Um, It'll also make it really difficult to attract those clients. Once you have those core values decided on, we'll go back a little bit, you can then look at some areas of your life or experiences that you're passionate about. Like I mentioned before, following your passion. Um, And I kind of already went into this, but... This is where you're going to get a little more granular in your industry. What industries might your ideal client be in? Is there an industry that you have experience in? Like I said, either in accounting or operationally. Did you work in retail like I did at any point in your career or in the restaurant? Um, You may have some operational knowledge that'll be really valuable to your clients uh, because you'll automatically understand their business process on a higher level. Um, You can also look at helping industries that you're passionate about, not necessarily like you have any experience in them, but if you maybe really love music like I do, I've honestly thought about um, trying to help out musicians. Are you totally into crafting um, and want to help out crafters or Etsy sellers with their books? Again, knowing the language of your client is going to be really helpful in attracting and communicating with them. So if it's something that even is just a hobby for you and you understand the lingo, you're a shoe in. Okay. Step three, narrowing it down. Now that you've added your industry layer on there, you can start putting yourself in the room with those perfect fit clients. Um, maybe check out some industry Facebook groups, networking groups. They're great for that. Uh, you can still take on varying industry client type clients, but after a while you can reevaluate the clients you do have and figure out what they all have in common and then narrow down your focus even more. This is when it starts getting really fun because then you can really systematize your business. Um, As you take on clients, you'll start to learn the types of businesses you more enjoy working with, but mostly it's about the clients and their personalities and values. So this is something you'll always be tweaking as you learn and grow, and I don't want you to be afraid to make a shift. So if you'd like to learn more of more places you can find new clients and how to close those clients, I do have a mini workshop series called the bookkeeping client closer and i will link it in the show notes but the website is ambitiousbookkeeper.com slash closer 
That is ambitiousbookkeeper.com slash closer. I don't know why I just did that like a commercial. <laughs> um, sometimes we get awkward when we're selling, okay? All righty. That is all my friends for today. I hope you found this useful. Once again, subscribe to the podcast, shout it out, send it to your friends, share it on Instagram. I appreciate you and I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Ambitious.